Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. Income investing has been shaken by the coronavirus pandemic, which has forced companies to cut back on dividends. That's a reoccurring payments which they make to shareholders. UK dividends are expected to fall this year by between 44% and 61%, or up to £55 billion. So is this a short-term setback, or will it have lasting repercussions? I'm joined by James Dow, who is Joint Manager of the Scottish American Investment Company, often referred to as Saints. James is also Joint Manager of the Global Income Growth Fund and the Responsible Global Equity Income Fund. But before we start, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. And this podcast is being recorded during lockdown, so James and I are both at home as opposed to in the usual Edinburgh studio. So James, let me start with what I alluded to in the introduction there. Are we seeing a permanent reset in dividend payments as a result of the coronavirus pandemic? I think yes, in some parts of the market, Malcolm, I think that is exactly what we're going to see. And what I'm what I'm hoping will come out on the back of this is a, a surge in what I would call good dividend investing. And those dividends, I think, will, will bounce back and be strong versus bad dividend investing, um, where I think you're going to see a permanent reset. So let, let me explain that a little bit more. Um, There is this, what I would call this good dividend investing, where um, as an income investor, you are essentially uh, looking for genuine growing companies that have got a a healthy balance between reinvesting in their own business and paying out dividends to shareholders. And where essentially you as as an investor or a saver are taking the if you like, the excess cash that they don't need in their own business themselves. And that's being used to support savers, um, folks in retirement, charities, the, the kind of kind of folks who are our clients. That's good dividend investing. I'm optimistic about that. Um, what I think we are going to see is the decline, and I, and I think this is this is a good good thing if it happens of of bad dividend investing. So that's where um, companies are frankly, over distributing, they're paying out too much, they're not investing enough in their own business, they may even be borrowing to pay dividends. Often these are companies which are structurally in decline, or they're low growth companies, Um, they're, they're paying these dividends in a sort of desperate attempt to entice shareholders. I think those kind of businesses, those kind of companies are going to be forced into a permanent reset into lower dividend payments to shareholders, as they should be. And give me an example of some of these sectors where we see good and bad dividend payers. Uh, well, uh, high street retail is a is a fairly obvious one. It's it's structurally challenged. There have been cases where, you know, companies are simply paying out too much. They're not investing in trying to make the transition to e commerce that kind of thing. In some parts of the oil and gas markets as well, um, I'm personally of the view that hydrocarbons generally are are let's say in the the sunset period of their lives. The catch with something like a a big oil company or or a bank or a telecoms company and uh, these kind of typical um, usual suspects of income funds is that they need to invest huge sums all the time just to keep their business level. Whereas if you look at uh, securities exchanges, so uh, if you think of Deutsche Börse, which is the dominant exchange in Germany, again, a very sort of capital light business model that throws off cash. That type of business is where you can have both growth because they don't need a lot of capital and you can have a really stable and resilient dividend because they naturally produce a lot of cash, the nature of the business. So that that's the type of thing that we're... Um, looking for. And, and the benefit of that has only been highlighted by the current crisis. You know, if you've got a very capital intense business model, you've really struggled. It's one of the reasons why the UK dividends have been under such pressure, because there's a preponderance of those capital heavy businesses in the UK. 
And what I find really interesting, James, is looking at the difference between UK dividend players and global dividend payers. And helpfully, the Link Group Dividend Monitor provides us with some stats here. If we look at the UK uh, dividends, they're expected to fall this year by between 44 and 61%. So that's up to £55 billion. Whereas the global dividend payers are expected to fall by between 15 and 35%, which is much less. And that's up to $933 billion. Um, these stats are correct as of um, May. Um, what does that tell us, James? Well, I think one thing it shows you is uh, the benefit of having a globally diversified income portfolio. Uh, you you uh, much more able to weather this storm if you've got that diversification outside of the UK market. Um, but I think another another thing that's really showing up is that the the UK market has a preponderance of these sort of structurally challenged industries and often, unfortunately, companies that have been over-distributing dividends. And that's really what you're seeing come through in these numbers is the, these businesses are forced to face up to the, the, the reality that's been brought on by COVID. So um, I, I'm, I'm cautious of being too downbeat about the UK my view is there are some great companies in the UK and and sustainable dividends within the UK, but there are very large parts of the market which are are not in that category. And so if you're a long-term income investor, you're going to be much better off looking not just in the UK, but outside the UK, looking globally and, and finding some of these good dividend companies, the, the you know, the, the Microsofts, the UPSs, the well, it's a long list of names that you can pick from globally. And if we're looking at the years to come, I mean, we, we've talked about maybe some of the energy, the oil and gas companies, which don't have the prospects for paying large dividends in the future. If we look five or 10 years time, what do you think the dividend payers of the future will look like? Well, I think they'll be very much in those categories, the sort of the going forwards categories. So uh, I'll give you a few examples. Um, healthcare is a is an obvious place to start. I think that the value that we as a society ascribe to healthcare going forward and our desire to see innovation and to pay for it is only going to go up over the years to come. So um, uh, within our portfolio, we'd have uh, uh, companies like Sonic Healthcare, a lab testing company, Roche, the genetics and testing company. How about um, automation? That's an interesting area right now. As folks go back to work and we're thinking about how you know factory floors are laid out and how engineering processes can happen, it seems to me that there's going to be even more of a demand for uh, automation on the factory floor to help with distancing and all those kind of thing. Another potential beneficiary of the way the world will be going forward. Uh, anything digital. I mean, it, it, we, we've seen this all of us in our own lives the past three months. Anything uh, digital that enables us to either work remotely or um, to collaborate without having to travel, all of those kind of things. Um, that Those types of businesses, whether it be uh, chip makers, software makers, whatever it might be, should be great beneficiaries. So uh, I know it's tempting to look at the current environment and think, oh, it's a sort of doom and gloom and oh, and all these things are going backwards. And, uh, but there are lots of different parts of uh, the market, types of businesses, which are going to thrive in the years to come, that are going to be more, in more demand than ever. So on a long-term view, I'd be very optimistic about those. And we've talked about tech and digital companies. But if we take a five or 10 year view, are you looking at different regions or countries that might offer attractive dividend paying opportunities in the future? The most exciting one there on the five to 10 year view has to be China. And again, I know there's a, a quite a lot of angst at the moment about China's place in the world and um, trade relations and so forth. But the thing with with great companies is that they tend to thrive regardless of the geopolitical climate. So if you've got a company that has a really great service, it's really in demand, it will tend to do well regardless of what, what the president of the US has tweeted recently or whatever. And there are a lot of those companies growing up right now in China. 
Um, there, there's huge innovation going on there. There are some great, often founder-run businesses. Uh, we've already seen many of them have already grown, you know, the Alibabas of the world to, to huge stature already. Um, and and uh, our view is, is there are, there are many more of those to come. At the same time, as an investor, a great thing that's happening is that the China market is opening up to foreign investors. So the, your um, one's ability to invest in the the local A share market um, has increased a lot over the past few years. That used to be very difficult to do. It's now now become a lot easier. So my my guess is that if we look out five or ten years, there are going to be a lot more of these great growth and dividend companies available to us for the portfolio and we'll be able to access those through the the China A share market. What's the difference in income payments between the investment trust and open-ended funds you manage and are the current levels of dividends sustainable in this environment? Yes, very much so. I mean it starts and this is common to both the the investment trust, the closed-ended and the open-ended um, funds, it starts with that underlying portfolio income resilience. So because they are effectively the same portfolios underlying them, the the, the, the starting point they're, they're both in is very strong. Where, where the difference comes about is because by um, the, the rules of these, these things, in an open-ended structure, you are legally required to pl- pay out all of your income in any given period. So what that means is if if our open-ended income is down by, let's say, for example, 5% this year, then the distribution will be down 5%. In the investment trust structure, you have this um, unusual advantage that you can kind of tuck away income over the years as a sort of savings pot. You don't always have to pay out all of the income you receive. And we've done that for years and years and years within Saints, as you know, the sort of prudence of the what's called the revenue reserve. Um, and what that means is although the portfolio income is again down by that, whatever it is, five, seven, eight percent, um, because of the revenue reserve within the investment trust structure, we can draw on those saved um, reserves that saved income from previous years and top up the income stream. So, in fact, the the, the board of saints has already announced uh, distribution, um, already done one through through the the COVID period, um, and in actually increased the dividend by about two and a half percent year on year because we were able to draw down a little bit of that money that we've we've saved, we've tucked away in years gone by. So that's really the difference is that the underlying form is, is essentially the same. But if you're looking for the absolute sort of security of income backed up by a savings pot, if you like, that's what you get with the investment trust structure. And that's why the, the distribution will actually be going up a little bit. And we're both sitting at home, you know, I don't know, maybe in an office, kitchen, living room, people mm. working in loads of different environments. How has this affected the way you work, James? Well, I've got a lot more requests to fix Brio train sets while working than I've ever done in the office because my five-year-old, being a, a Brio engineer par excellence, um, likes to get me involved in that as often as possible. So that that's something I haven't dealt with before. No, but the the um, uh, in practice, it's gone really smoothly. I'm delighted to say. Um, I feel like the 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 technology, you know, we've always invested in that heavily ourselves as a firm, and that's really paid off in spades in the past six months. Um, I haven't had any issues there. Um, you know, I guess like all of us, I'm kind of a little bit bored of looking at Zoom screens and people on that. I like talking to people face to face. But okay, that's that that's not possible. Um, we, we've coped. F- f- um, fine, no, no, no real problems. W- one thing that I-, I think is really interesting is about how working practices adopted under a kind of, you know, forced situation that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. You realise afterwards, oh wow, that's a lot better than we used to do when we could meet up in practice. I don't doubt that on the other side of this, our ability to to you know keep on top of all the different things that we're looking at will actually be improved on the other side of this compared with where, where, when we went in. Oh, that's a good place to end it, James. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast now. I hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks very much. You can find our podcast short briefings on long-term thinking at baileygifford.com forward slash podcasts. 
and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and TuneIn. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please spread the word. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which was released on permanent vacation. And if you're listening at home, stay well, and we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. 